All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for attending this webinar today. We have a great webinar for our inaugural uh, webinar for the Bodrum Educational Series for this year. Um, today, um, we'll be having great cases presented by Professor Chris, Christopher Griffiths and Dr. Jean Bologna. Um, today, it's my introduction to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker, Professor Chris Griffiths, is a true luminary in the world of dermatology with an impressive career that spans across several prestigious institutions, including the University of Manchester and King's College London. He has made significant contributions to the field. Prof Griffiths has been recognized with numerous accolades, including the OBE for his outstanding service to dermatology. He's a prolific author, the editor-in-chief of Rook's Textbook of Dermatology and a leading expert in psoriasis and skin aging research. We're honored to have him share his wealth of knowledge and experience with us today. Our second speaker, Dr. Bologna, is also equally a luminary in the field of dermatology, currently serving as the Vice Chair of Faculty Affairs and Department of Dermatology at Yale's University School of Medicine. Dr. Bologna's career has been defined by her outstanding contributions and leadership roles in dermatology, and she has held numerous prestigious positions, um, including President of Key Dermatologic Societies and Vice President of renowned organizations. Furthermore, she is the Senior Editor of the Influential Dermatology Textbook, considered a cornerstone of dermatologic knowledge. Um, we are honored to have both of our speakers here with us today, and we eagerly anticipate their insightful contributions to our talk. Um, so I just wanted to go through some housekeeping cases at this point. Um, so the meeting host today will be um, me, Akash Varma. I'm a dermatology resident at Mount Sinai in New York in the United States, and Karen Waithera, who is a resident training in dermatology in Kenya. Um, so the Globe Training Committee, just a quick summary, um, we're, an, we're an arm of the International Alliance for Global Health Dermatology, also known as GLOGERM, and our goals are to promote knowledge equity by improving access to education for dermatology trainees across the world. And we aim to provide free educational events and opportunities to build networks and collaborate. And just some meeting etiquette, um, as this is a webinar, your audio and video will be muted for the duration of the webinar. But if you do have any questions or comments, you can share them via the chat function and our meeting hosts including me and Karen, we'll share these with the speakers at the end of the webinar and maybe in between their cases so we can go through some questions at that time. We'll also be some sh sharing some information about the Glowdrum Trainee Committee and the chat function, so please be on the lookout for that. Um, all right, so now I can have Dr. Uh, Professor Griffiths share his screen. Okay, can you see that? Okay, yep. Yep. Great, okay, well, thank you so much, Akash, for that um, kind introduction. This will be, the, I think, the third of these trainee webinars I've been involved with. The first one was, I think, in 2020, when I talked about pustular psoriasis, and then I think about a year ago, Esther Freeman and I were, inv were invited to support, talk about registries. But today, it's a real um, pleasure to be talking about um, great cases. And I've chosen cases which are, some of which are, are on their own, maybe not too exciting, but they're important milestones in my career and I think are important in global dermatology. And then I've chosen some other interesting and somewhat unusual cases. And we'll see how we go over the next um, 25 minutes or so. Uh, to start though, you think it's unusual that um, I will be on the same um, agenda as uh, Dr. Bologna, because in essence, we are publishing rivals. And that we both, uh, I have the great privilege of um, being the editor in chief of Rook's textbook of dermatology, which is approaching its 10th edition, which will come out next year. And of course, um, Jean has the um, eponymous uh, Jean's and um, Bologna's dermatology now in its fourth edition, both of which I would say are cornerstones of um, dermatology education. But of course, Jean and I are not necessarily rivals. We're actually very good friends. We served on the ILDS committee for eight years together, and there's a very memorable occasion when we were um, invited to the Italian Embassy in London at the time that we were on the Scientific Committee for um, the uh, World Congress in Milan in 2019. And uh, this is a picture taken in 2016, where we are at home in our um, palatial surroundings. Um, I'm taking the back, the back seat here because the real star of the show is there on the front. <laughs> okay, let's go into some cases then. So this first case, uh, I don't know if you can see the top of the screen here, um, is a young man who has um, severe um, sudden onset psoriasis. And his picture is taken in 1985. So my dermatology career spans 
almost 40 years. So these are pictures are taken when I was a registrar. And this is important because I trained in London at St. Mary's Hospital and our inpatient ward was across the corridor from the inpatient ward for the um, uh, venereology patients. And in 1984, we started to be asked to uh, consult on a number of um, unusual skin conditions in young homosexual men. And not just uh, unusual conditions such as histoplasmosis, which we rarely saw in the UK, but very florid infection. And also were being referred people, uh, men who had seborrheic dermatitis and sometimes very severe psoriasis. And at that time, we were not sure what, what, you know, why these young men were so unwell and this was an invariably fatal condition, but these were the very first patients with AIDS in the UK and St. Mary's Hospital was where they were managed. And so we were able to see a whole panoply of presentations, cutaneous manifestations of AIDS at that time and wrote one of the first articles sort of laying out the glossary of um, dermatological presentations, one of which um, was um, development of seborrheic dermatitis and also severe sudden onset psoriasis. So I think that's, in, that's important just to bear that in mind as that that reaches right back over almost 40 years. And in those days, there was no treatment for HIV infection. The next case is uh, another a young woman I saw also when I was a registrar, the 24 year old woman from Thailand who had come to London to work as a cleaner. And um, she had um, been referred by her GP as is this psoriasis. She'd had this lesion for about nine years on her right um, knee, sorry, right knee. And this is an interesting case because it um, shows the importance of doing a full examination. So looking at that, you can see straight away that you know, this is the only lesion that she had, it'd been progressive. And you can see this is definitely not psoriasis. You can see that it's been progressive. It's well demarcated, a little bit of scale. That's why the GP was probably fooled. But also there's some scarring, but these are juicy infiltrated um, plaque. So what could the, uh, what are the differential diagnosis here in, the, in a woman of this age? Well, this is lupus vulgaris. This is cutaneous lupus, which is um, primary cutaneous lupus, which is, occurs in people uh, primary cutaneous TB rather, which is seen in people who are not previously um, immunized, of course, due to mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's still a rare presentation of TB, but it's persistent, it's progressive, usually on the limbs, and can eventuate in a squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, can often be missed. In the past, we used to use diascopy, which was just pressing a glass slide onto the lesion. You can see these apple jelly nodules. Now, nowadays, you could be more sophisticated and use dermoscopy. The other um, form of cutaneous um, TB, which is not so common nowadays, which is seen in people with immunity, is a sort of warty TB, tuberculosis varicose acutis. It used to be called prosector's wart. Now, prosectors were people who worked in the autopsy room and they may, get, may, may have got that through inoculation of um, a dissection of people who had died of TB. Diagnosis is caseating granulomas, AFB and acid fast bacilli are rare in these lesions and one should check uh, MANTU or nowadays and, and interfere on gamma release assay. Now the treatment varies from region to region but usually involves um, use of rifampicin and fembitol isoniazid with, with or without pyrazinamide. So she was treated with rifampicin, methambutyl, and isoniazid after the diagnosis was made. However, a week after she had started treatment, there was a problem. She was readmitted to hospital through the accidents and emergency department because she was hypotensive, she had severe abdominal pain, and she had collapsed at home. And important on the examination is that she had a, a very low sodium. So what was happening here and something that hadn't been picked up because we didn't have MR scans in those days was that she had had adrenal involvement by TB. Now her mineralocorticoid production was sufficient enough for her to be okay. But as soon as she went on to rifampicin, which you may know uh, it, uh, is an inducer of those metabolizing enzymes in the liver, the mineralocorticoids, her reserve dropped too low and she went into Addisonian crisis. So the lesson there is always to do a thorough examination and check other sites for TB, even though you think it may just be isolated to the skin. And remember that little caveat about rifampicin. Now, when I was in Michigan, this is a man from the University of from Michigan, the United States. I worked there for seven years. We did a lot of work um, developing the whole concept around the use of topical retinoids for the treatment and management of photoaging. 
And there was a medical student working with me who was recruiting um, subjects for these studies. And one day he came to me, he's a guy called Rob Singer. And he said, um, I've seen some of these patients who seem to have an asymmetry of their um, photo aging, more wrinkles on one side or the other. And it seems to me it's commoner on the left side of the face. So I asked him why he thought that might be. And he was a smart guy, he's now a dermatologist. He started off as a medical student working with us. And he thought it might be due to driving a car and so he said, well, who's going to, um, to, who's going to be the, the population that are going to have that the most expressed the most? It will be professional drivers, Teamster Union members who drive those big trucks in the United States. So Rob then used to go down to Detroit every couple of weeks and give a lecture to um, team, Teamster Union uh, members about skin, skin cancer, and do an examination of their faces after the lecture. And sure enough, the, the um, photo aging, wrinkling, as you can see here, was more prevalent on the left side of the face. That implicates UVA in photo damage. The studies have now been done in Australia, and also we did a study in coach drivers in the UK. And of course, in Australia and the UK, we drive on the other side of the road, the left side of the road, and the steering wheels on the right side. So it should, and of course, the face um, was more photo damaged on the right in the people in the UK and in Australia. So that was an important insight. There's now several pictures circulating of very extreme examples of this. This is a, uh, another truck driver from the United States and you can see here, very extreme difference between the left side of the face and the right. And you know, but this was all through recruitment of patients or people with photo aging and the work we did with retinoids has stood the test of time. Here's one of the studies that we did using topical retinoic acid. And you can see the very dramatic effects that we got with topical retinoids and of course nowadays, we are working not so much on photo aging, uh, but on intrinsic chronologic aging. But the insights we got working on photo aging and the work on retinoids has led to the work we're doing nowadays. So that was an instructive case. The next case is a very highly instructive for me in my career. This is a 27 year old woman who um, developed her term, had uh, increased hair growth on her cheeks. And I think that she is a revolutionary case. So she had had the, you can see this sort of lanugo type hair uh, just on the, um, on the cheeks, which she had not had previously. And it de developed over a matter of about eight, eight weeks or so. And she wasn't very happy about that. So of course you then start to think, well, what are the causes of hypertrichosis in a young woman? And I guess you've got that sort of little list in, uh, that you think about when you see that. So is it porphyria cutanea tarda, where she had no other symptoms or signs of that? Anorexia nervosa, no, certainly you could see that she was not underweight just looking at her. Malignancy, she's a young woman, but you need to exclude that. And then there's a number of drugs that can do this. Phenytoin, anabolic steroids, minoxidil, and cyclosporin. And she is important because um, she was the very first patient, one of the very first in the world, and certainly in the UK, that we use cyclosporin on to treat psoriasis. And she responded extremely well, so well that she was more concerned about the hypertrichosis on the cheeks than anything else. But she's um, a very instructive case because up until that um, we used cyclosporin and her, we no one had really thought that psoriasis was a T cell mediated disease. And because of the work we did that one, her, her, that one case, we then did a larger study, which was published in the British Medical Journal, where we showed that psoriasis does respond very well to cyclosporin. We never thought that when we were using the drug that it was going to be a sort of viable, a licensed treatment, which of course it became. We used it because we'd done a lot of work showing what we thought was very good evidence that psoriasis was mediated by T cells and immune autoimmune disease, but um, no one believed us. And then this new drug came out, which has been used to prevent transplant rejection which targeted T cells. We thought, well, if cyclosporin works, then it's probably going to prove our point. And it did work and worked very well. And that sort of set in chain the whole um, uh, number of studies and understanding of the immunology of psoriasis, which has led inexorably to where we are today, where we have the biologic therapies, which are far, obviously far better and more precisely targeted than cyclosporin. But I think she was a sort of index case almost. If it hadn't worked for her, I mean, probably have, have given, it, given it up and gone on to something else. Well, here's a man I saw in Salford just before I left uh, Salford to come down to London. So this is something completely different. This is a man 
who um, complained of a little lump on his nipple. He said, I've got two, two uh, nipples on one side. He said, I only had one before. And it's very painful. Not always, but it's painful from time to time. And I want you to do something about it. Um, so, of course, this enters into your, you know, one of the sort of the common questions that you get uh, in the clinic. You see someone with a painful nodule. And you go through, you know, what are the what is what's the mnemonic that you use to try and I, you know, identify a painful nodule? This is one that I've used. It's called lend an egg, and it could be a lyomyoma, eccrine spiroadenoma, not so likely, neuroma could be, but it doesn't look much like that. Dermatofibroma be an unusual site, and dermatofibromas are only a little bit itchy and painful when they first develop. Angiolipoma, it's usually more sub subcutaneous than that. Neurilimoma, very uncommon, very unusual, unlikely to be that. Endometrioma, no, it's male. Glomus tumor, usually on the fingers, and granular cell tumor. So which of those is it likely to be? One other bit of uh, data from the history is that he said it was particularly painful on cold days. Mm. So this is a lyomyoma. Very unusual presentation, but a cutaneous lyomyoma. Now, this is a, a case which got worldwide uh, interest. So I was working, it sounds a bit like sort of Frankenstein movie. I was working in the lab late one night, which is true. And I got a phone call from the BBC news desk. This was in September, 2004. They said, um, Professor Griffiths, um, we've, got a, we've got some um, photographs that have come through on the wire and with um, the president, well, what the, one of the presidential candidates for presidency of Ukraine. And he's got a very severe skin problem and we want to know what it is. So they sent me this picture. And this is a very famous picture and a very famous case. So this man you may recognize is um, uh, Viktor Lushenko, who uh, went on to become the president of Ukraine but uh, was running for presidential office in 2004. And it's sort of like almost like a replay of what's happening nowadays because he was not the, the, um, the candidate that, was, uh, that the, the Russians wanted to win. He was opposed, he was much more Europhilic. He wanted to you know, take Ukraine into the, into the European Union and Russia were not happy about that. So he presented with this. Now, this, as you probably recognize, is um, this is how he was just a few weeks previously. So it's a very dramatic, sudden change. So that's why BBC wanted me to make a call on what this was. And I said, well, looking at it, this looks to me like what we call claw acne. But it's very unusual for it to develop that quickly. And this has been exposed to very high um, quantity of dioxin. So this is dioxin poisoning. Dioxin is uh, 2378-tetrachlorodibenzodioxin, tetra TCDD. And um, he had been poisoned by at a, at a dinner at the beginning of September. And he became, as you can, can imagine, because the blood levels of dioxin were about 50,000 high, times higher than what you'd find in the normal population. And it's called chloracne, though chloracne is a misnomer, really, because this isn't acne. It affects the sebaceous glands. It's probably better known now as MADISH, meta metabolizing acquired di dioxin-induced skin hamartomas. So dioxin is concentrated in the sebaceous glands, and then it's a sort of genotoxin, and it uh, produces these hamartomas. And so what he has are comedones and hamartomas, which are looks like cysts. And this can occur due to poisoning, as I've just mentioned, or occupational exposure, or due to industrial accidents. And there's a very famous one in Northern Italy in a place called Cervezo in 1976, where an in industrial plant uh, caught fire and there's large amounts of dioxin released into the atmosphere. And there's a lot of cases of chloracne at that time. Um, Viktor Yushchenko was seriously unwell, was air transferred out from Kiev to um, Vienna. He had pancreatitis and liver toxicity, he didn't have the neuropathy. And uh, the diagnosis is made by histology and also the presence of the cytochrome P450 enzyme CYP1A1. And um, he was then managed by a person that Jean and I know well, uh, Professor Jean-Hilaire Sorat, who was professor of dermatology in Geneva. And um, he managed him very well. 
um, to just managing the skin manifestations. But around that grew up this whole new subspecialty of dermatotoxicology. And it's because of the work that Professor Sorat did, and this is published in the Lancet in about 2009. And we've got a much better understanding of how this, how this happens. And he treated them with uh, isotretinoin, which is probably not going to work very well, and also um, infliximab, but, and then uh, laser and dermabrasion, et cetera. And about a year and a half later, he looked like this. So it's obviously a very significant improvement. But um, you know, he survived, and he's, uh, but it was a, a, a very important case, I think, how you know, chloracne or a, derm a dermatology condition really became headline news. Now, this man is, um, I think I'll take the questions at the end of my 25 minutes. Is that okay, Akash? I see that someone's raised their hand, but if I do that at the end. Um, yeah, so this is a man who is also a very important in my career. Um, he has, um, this is a 42-year-old man who we saw, I saw in Mandalay in Myanmar, Burma, which is a Southeast Asian country with a population of about 58 million people, and um, saw him in December 2018. And I went to Myanmar um, with um, Dr. Su Lin, who is a, a senior registrar in dermatology at St. John's Institute of Dermatology in London. She's uh, Burmese born and invited me to visit dermatology centers in the country. So this man has, um, you can see he's a little bit Cushingoid. He's got red patches on his cheeks. He's got deformity of his hands. And he has you know, classic, very severe psoriatic arthritis has cardiovascular disease, has diabetes, but he'd only been treated with steroid-containing topicals. And his, this case really brought home to me that here you have a country that's got some great doctors, really keen, but their facilities, even in the big city centers, are not, are not sufficient to manage these more severe cases. So when Dr. Lewin, and his picture over here, and I got, came back to London uh, or to the UK after these visiting these various hospitals, you can see here the inpatients, and that's the outpatients area in, in, in Mandalay. We felt that you know, maybe there's something we could do to help our colleagues in, in Myanmar to improve skin care in the country. So we founded this charity called the Burma Skin Care Initiative, which is founded on the sort of re usual three pillars of clinical service, research, and education, and a sustainable enterprise working with our colleagues in Myanmar. We founded that in 2019. And been very successful of course now we had to face covid and then there's been a military coup in the country but we've found ways around those problems um you know something we call essential emergency skin care just published a paper on this in the british journal of dermatology but it was that man who i felt you know he if he'd been in manchester or london or in, in new haven he would have got biologics and he would never have got to that stage and I felt, why just the fact that by chance of birth, he happened to be in Myanmar, why shouldn't he get the best treatment available? And that's why, that's really the impetus for me, particularly to, to help Sue found this charity. Now, this is a man I've seen, so about three years ago, a man with severe psoriasis, been on biologics, and he came, we started them on secukinumab, you know, NTR 17A, and he came back to see me about three weeks later, and he said, uh, Professor Griffiths, um, my psoriasis has changed. I don't know what's happened. He said it doesn't, the scaling looks different. It's all small scales now, not big scales, and it's very itchy. So what's going on? So what's happened here? He has something called paradoxical eczema. And we've all heard of paradoxical psoriasis, people on anti-TNFs for, say, rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease. But uh, and they go on to an anti-TNF and then they develop psoriasis. In this case, he's developed atopic eczema. And we've looked, we've seen several cases of those now. In Manchester, when I was last there, we'd seen about 20. In Bad Beer, the big registry for psoriasis biologics in the UK, there are well over 100 cases and probably far more because it's probably overlooked. And um, we see it with all classes of biologics. I think it happens more with the anti-IL-17s and IL-23s but they develop almost classic atopic eczema. Their psoriasis resolves and they now have eczema. They've got eosinophilia, they have raised IgA, I, IgE rather, and usually they have a prior history of sort of atopy. So we've done some you know, detailed investigation of this, but Dr. Ali Aljanabi, who's a MRC fellow, a resident in Manchester, has done this work showing that they have a systemic inflammatory proteome that's similar to atopic dermatitis with 
polygenic risk scores similar to what you see with atopic dermatitis. And that's there before they develop the phenotype. So you could screen for these people. Now, management is very difficult. So we put him on to gazolkumab, you know, NTR23, and he developed exactly the same thing. Mm. But we decided that in this case, that we'll just keep things going. We managed, the, the psoriasis was completely clear on the gazolkumab, and we managed the atopic eczema with antihistamines and occasional topical steroids. And he's still doing fine about, you know, uh, four or five years later. Uh, but we have got some patients who it's been very hard to manage. And we've got one or two patients who are on a combination of a, an NTR23 and uh, dupilumab. So it uh, just shows that you can bring out other diseases with the biologics. Um, and you've got to be aware that that can happen. And I think it's probably overlooked. Now, this is a boy I saw in Michigan. He's a boy who was referred to us by um, community, from community care, very switched on community care, person, because he thought this 10 year old boy had maybe um, crab lice nits in his um, um, eyelashes. Because remember, crab lice is not going to, doesn't have any pubic hair, but crab lice can adapt to um, eyelashes because the, the hair thickness is the same as you find in pubic hair. So he thought these might be nits. But a key thing was that this boy also had a hoarse voice. And um, when we examined him, there are some other features there. We rapidly came to the diagnosis. I guess some of you know, know what this may be. It's a very rare condition, but you don't forget it once you've seen it. And it's um, lipoid proteinosis or urbach Bright's disease. And this is maniliform blepharosis. They usually have scarring, thick skin. They have hoarseness because the vocal cords are affected by this hyaline-like material deposition. And there are some cases of epilepsy and autism, interestingly. It's it autosomal recessive, it's rare, and it's commonest, if you can say it's common in South Africa, and it's due to a loss of function mutation in the extracellular matrix protein one. Treatment is difficult. You can use oral DMSO, or, or you can treat the sort of the um, lesions, even the ones on the vocal cords with local ablation. Importantly, though, the lifespan is normal. So this is a sort of important, interesting case. And then this is uh, probably the last case that I'll come to because I'm running short of time. So this is a man, again, going back to psoriasis. This is a man who's 51. Um, who's, he had been uh, had psoriasis for 30 years. And he'd been on um, adalimumab, anti-TNF, for seven years. But in the six weeks prior to me seeing him in the clinic, he started developing these red tender plaques on his face. So what's going on? You've got a man with red tender plaques in his face. He feels a bit tired, but otherwise okay. He doesn't have a, a temperature. He doesn't have a um, leukocytosis. So the differentials for the plaques on the face are the sort of classic ones, sweet disease, so you have no other features of that. Sarcoid is always the great mimicker. Lupus profundus, be unusual to look like that. Lymphoma, either B-cell lymphoma or um, mycosis fungoides. Gessner's benign lymphocytic infiltrate, Brennan-Lemus's rosacea, though this would be an unusual presentation of that. Someone who's on a biologic, you've got to think of an unusual infection, in this case, a deep fungal infection, or could it be a drug reaction? So we did these tests, you know, um, all normal, except for the skin biopsy, which you might imagine. And the skin biopsy showed these um, palisading uh, granuloma around some um, necrobiosis, and lots of mucin deposition. So he had something called interstitial granulomatous dermatitis, uh, which presents exactly like he has presented. It's unusual. It's more commonly associated, as you may know, with connective tissue disease and arthritis. And it's often seen on the, as a paraneoplastic phenomenon and associated with a variety of hematological diseases, but also it can be drug induced. And the drugs that are known to do it now these, and of course, anti-TNF biologics have been reported, and that's exactly what would happen in his case. He'd had th this was induced by the adalimumab, even though he had been on it for for seven years. This happened, and um, so we switched. We stopped the the um, adalimumab, switched them to ixekizumab, anti R seventeen, and it, they responded very it responded very quickly. This picture is taken just about four weeks later, and it's already starting to recede. So again, you see someone, some people on biologics are going to have unusual things. You've always got to think about that. Um, Akash, shall I stop there? It's 5.30 my time. 
Yep, I think that's great. Is that um, okay? I, I'm happy to take some questions. I hope that was okay and a few sort of that interesting was, cases. That was absolutely wonderful. And I think um, if anybody has any questions, we don't see any posted in the chat just yet. But if anybody has any questions, this would be the best time to either raise your hand or put them in the chat would be the best option. I guess the question that appears to be was, have they seen any of these sort of, you know, obviously you've seen the psoriasis and these sorts of things, but um, what about those more unusual cases I showed you, such as uh, lipoid proteinosis? So once you've seen it, you don't forget it. I don't know if anyone's seen that before in, in real life, rather than, the tech, rather than those two great textbooks that I showed at the beginning. Is, quite, is there quite a lot in the chat or not? Um, so no, there's no questions in the chat just yet. I think people have been introducing where they're uh, watching from. Okay. Um, so yeah, we'll okay. just give another two minutes and then we'll let um, Dr. Bologna speak. Oh, we just had a question. I think Karen will start reading them out. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I, I can't see the question, Doc. Can you see it? Maybe you can read it for me. Um, sure. So the first question is from Man Ho Chung. He is asking, have you seen paradoxical lupus reactions with anti-IL-17 inhibitors? Anti-IL-17? No, I've not seen that. No, I've not seen that. Uh, you've got to think about lupus with patients on anti-TNFs, but, um, you know, there's... Um, that is actually extremely unusual to see with the anti-TNFs, even though we always do the um, antibody screening. But of course, we manage the clinical manifestations and not antibody levels. But um, I think that the illustrative thing here is that you've always got to think, you should never be complacent when you have someone on a biologic. Mm. I think you've always got to think about unusual infections, common infections as well. But the one thing we learned from COVID you know, we set up this COVID register called So Protect with colleagues, you know, uh, Catherine Smith and Sapin Maher and Jonathan Barker at uh, St. John's, which taught us that patients on biologics are actually protected from the more severe manifestations of COVID. Obviously, you know, their susceptibility to severe disease is the same as other, the other uh, markers of susceptibility to severe disease, such as being overweight and male and ethnic minority and um, um, over 65. But the biologic, the only biologic that increased risk is not one that is one that we only use occasionally, but not for psoriasis, and that's rituximab. Uh, but overall, the biologics, rather than being immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory, and in this situation um, in during COVID, they actually seem to be protective of having severe disease and being you know, admitted to hospitals. So we learned a lot. So diseases can teach you a lot about the drugs that we use. All right, I think we should, uh, I should stop there. I'll stop sharing and I'll hand over to, uh, to Jean. Sure. Can you tell me if you can see? Yep, we can see that. Perfect. I think right before you go, Chris, there were a couple people that wanted you to recap your your approach to paradoxical eczema. If you could just recap that for them. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So the recap is that A, it's difficult to treat. Um, I think you've got to you've got to treat the the eczema. Um, you can try switching biologic. That's the first thing to do. So, you know, go back from an IL-17 to maybe an anti-TNF. And you can do that in the first instance, but um, quite often once they've into that pathway, it's hard to get out of it. And that's why I mentioned that some patients have actually been, we've had to put them on dual biologics. Now, obviously that's an expensive option, but uh, we've tried JAK inhibitors, which work better for the eczema than they do for the psoriasis. So the best way forward is to be able to identify those patients before who are susceptible to this before we treat them with the biologic. And they're a small number, but they finish up being very complex and very difficult to treat. Thanks a lot. Okay. I can't think of anybody better to, to share uh, this afternoon, this evening with, uh, other than my friend, Chris Griffiths. Um, we've been together a long time as friends, and I always enjoy his company. I'm going to start off 
with my rules of three. Because I think a lot of people in medicine try to complicate things. And I always wonder why they complicate them. Is it because they don't understand it or because it's more of an elitist move? So I like to simplify. So for me, here are my rules of three. And that is for etiology, I like common, uncommon, rare. I like for disease severity to be mild, moderate, or severe. Now, I realize that people are worried about artificial intelligence, but if there's one thing we can be happy about, it's that the AI is going to finally do all your posse scores for you. So you won't have to sit there and figure out an exact score. But nonetheless, when I walk in the room to see a patient, I like to judge mild, moderate, severe. And is it acute, subacute, or chronic? And let me give you an example. If you look at the Alden score, so someone could say, well, what's the likely um, drug that caused TEN? And I walk in the room and I look at the list of meds and I say, well, these two are high prob, this one's moderate prob, the rest are low prob. And they say, but you didn't use the Alden score. And I say, well, let's look at the Alden score for a minute. And that is you get need six or more points for it to be very probable. And I get three points for the patient being on the drug for five to 28 days. I get nothing for them having it at the time of the onset of the rash, the drug on board, either because of half-lives or because they're actually on the drug. And I get nothing for having stopped the drug. Now, if you look at the list, yes, you get points for a re-challenge, but we have to think to ourselves, how often do we walk in the room with somebody with TEN and they've been re-challenged? It's quite a rare event. So in the end, it comes down to what you see in the green box is, is it a high prob, mod prob, or low prob drug? So even though it sounds fancy to say you used an Alden score, sometimes common, uncommon, and rare, or high, medium, and low, are actually a much better way to think in your mind. In addition, I use the rules of three for response to therapy, better, worse, same, and level of evidence. Now, I'm sure I'm going to offend someone when I say that I use it for level of evidence because I'm not one that sits around worrying about whether or not most of the studies in the review were cohort or case control. And I'm sorry, but I don't. I just need to know, is the evidence for this treatment high, medium, or low? And in dermatology, a fair amount of the medications we use and the topical treatments we use are low. But you have to move on. You can't just become paralyzed by the fact that we don't have high evidence for everything we do. So I'm much more into high, medium, and low. And when it comes to treating patients and evaluating them, I think that if they're doing better, you're happy. If they're doing about the same, you start to worry a little. You start to think about what else you can do. And when they're worse, you have to regroup. You have to be honest with yourself. And then you're going to say to you, get help, ask others, et cetera. But I really think the rules of three when practicing clinical medicine makes your life a lot easier as well as reflective in assessing uh, how you're doing with regard to therapy. So the one concept that I'd like to get across this afternoon is that sometimes stepping back is better than a closer look. And Chris, we did not go over this ahead of time, but he talked to you about that young woman who had the lesion on the elbow of lupus vulgaris and the idea that you need to do a to not just a total body skin exam, but in his case, even a total systemic examination. But I think with the advent of dermoscopy, it's really nice. You have a pigmented lesion, you go ahead, you take a look at it. But if somebody comes in with a rash, it's a good idea to step back and look at distribution rather than immediately uh, getting out the dermatoscope. So what I like to have you come away with is that when we talk about histology, we often talk about a 4X, 20X, 100X examination of the slide. But I think in our minds, we as clinicians should start thinking about similar levels of examination in the clinical arena. 
And I think when we first look at a person, just like a derm path person looks at a slide, we often are at 20x. And so the decision has to be made, am I going to go to four or am I going to go to 100? So this is what I mean, 4x, 20x, 100x. And so my thesis today is that you need to start thinking about going 4x before you go 100x, especially in the case of a cutaneous eruption. And let me give you an example. You walk in the room, you see this. What do you see? You see that sort of brick red color, a bit dull. You see lack of integrity of the skin. I always talk about when it comes to erosions and ulcers, I like to talk about what is at the bottom of the hole. And so in this case, I know I'm looking at dermis. And so I have full thickness loss of the epidermis. I have what is sometimes referred to as cigarette paper wrinkling of the skin. I'm not sure if the PC police are gonna get rid of that term. You'll have to hang on. And I see that it is a large area of involvement. The patient is on uh, Bactrim, Septra. Another thing I don't get too worried about is the use of trade names. Um, for example, if you were to go in to see a patient and you say, are you on trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole? I'm not really sure that they would be able to give you an accurate answer. Whereas if you say, are you on Scepter or Bactrim? They say yes or no. Uh, so I think that sometimes if you want to have a cause in life, don't pick whether or not somebody made a generic or trade name uh, statement. I would move to something a bit more important. And you already see that the person has a uh, Vaseline impregnated gauze, therefore trying to give a uh, fake epidermis, so to speak. And they're already on an exu dry pad so that their skin doesn't stick to the bed and you make the diagnosis of TEN. However, that's because you had a close up look. Had you decided to step back, you would see that there were large areas of sparing particularly on that upper arm, as you see. It is as if the person has taken plates or platters and then put that on the skin, but did not take a paintbrush and paint the entire trunk. Instead, they have taken a configuration, put it on the body, made it that dull red purple color, but with definite areas of uninvolved skin. And if you then look at other areas on the patient, you will see even larger areas of sparing. And some of the lesions are more the size maybe of a Frisbee or a bowl, but nonetheless, it has a similar type of appearance. And as you get to the smaller ones, I'm hoping you're saying to yourself, I don't think this is TEN because I have stepped back I have taken a 4X examination of the patient. And this is the patient, uh, patient's abdomen uh, on the right there. And I'm trying to show you its comparison to a patient with SJS that has become then moved on to TEN because this patient has generalized bull's fixed drug eruption. And in my opinion, there are a number of patients called TEN who actually have generalized bull's fixed drug eruption. And as I said before, when you have those disorders, it, as SJS may start off more as an exanthem, then become diffuse, or it can start off as a paintbrush of the entire trunk. But to have this kind of sparing of the trunk and these localized lesions, this is not TEN. And I try to say to myself, well, why is it people get the two things confused? Well, I think they get it confused because the histology is similar, the drugs are similar. And then another reason, especially in the hospital, is trying to talk to non-dermatologists about fixed drug eruption. You see their eyes glaze over. You know that they don't believe you. Um, they've, unless they're a urologist who gives a lot of septra, they've never seen a case. And they're very, very skeptical. But my way out of the situation is to simply bring up the idea of resident memory T cells. 
And once you give just the tiniest bit of pathophysiology, for whatever reason, you can win the argument. So that's my pearl on this deal. So I think one of the major reasons, again, as I said before, is that similar high prob drugs. Histology will show epidermal necrosis. And people will talk about the fact that you can have incontinent pigment or melanophages in the dermis as a clue. Well, that's a clue for recurrent disease. And it's a clue when the patient has darker skin phototypes, but it may not be present in a patient who has lighter skin phototypes, even if it is recurrent. And so then others will argue with you, oh, well, it's more superficial and deep versus superficial, et cetera, et cetera. In the end, what I try to say is the dermatopathologist puts me on the right highway, but I, as the clinician, have to take the pathology plus the clinical and get in the correct lane. And I appreciate them getting me on the right highway. I don't want to detour. I don't want to go down the wrong road. But you cannot say that the dermatopathologist has the final say on these patients. The final say is the clinician who puts the two together. And another reason I think that we don't think about generalized bolus fixed drug eruption is because we have what I call the mental image. And the mental image means what would you say to a medical student who asks you, how does a lesion of fixed drug eruption appear? And you would say a coin-sized lesion. It may be dull in the, the dull red, violet in the center. It may even have a bulla. And it has more of a circular to oval uh, shape. And... You can see sometimes uh, a little bit of uh, loss of epidermis if that bullish should slough. And then as it heals, you get hyperpigmentation due to incontinent pigment. However, generalized bullish big drug eruption is more unusual than the classic, of course. And in addition, it sometimes doesn't register within that mean plus or minus two standard deviations. Now, I don't think you should ever be confusing SJS in its early stages with generalized bolus fixed drug eruption. Now, once SJS becomes confluent and you move to an overlap situation, then yes, you could confuse the two. But in the beginning, it is an exanthem. And it is what does I refer to as extra crispy. And what do I mean by that? Well, the original recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken is what I see as a more belliform eruption. And then if I see fragility, especially over the scapulae, if you have a patient in the hospital and you're trying to decide, oh, is this a more belliform eruption or even in the clinic versus early SJS, look over their scapulae because that's an area that gets sheared in bed when they're sleeping. And you will see loss of epidermis in those areas, or you may touch it and the skin will slough. So I look for sloughing, fragility, of course, vesicles are bully. And is there mucosal involvement? And do you have that dusky color? Okay. And then I refer to the eruption as extra crispy. And then I know I have to be more on guard. So let me show you what I mean. If you first walked into the room and saw the patient here, I'm going to try to use my arrow there, and saw the patient there. And I just want you to look from the waist down, not from the waist up, waist down. And tell me if you just think that's a bad morbelliform eruption. But you look over the scapulae, and there is the fragility and loss of epidermis. And now you're moving towards SJS. In the other patient, if you look at the upper shoulder at first glance, or biliform eruption, you go down onto the delta, further down the arm, and you see bully. And again, on our other patient over here, you start to see the bulla formation, but most importantly, you see that sloughing and fragility. So it's similar to PCT. People always talk about bully on the backs of the hands, but sometimes the bully aren't there. What you do see is the fragility, and that can be e an even better sign. And again, to remind you that the bulls fixed drug eruptions is if somebody took plates and put them on the skin, not nickels and dimes, but rather plates. And sometimes 
even platters. Now, this is a patient that I was told had TEN. But again, if you go to 4X, you step back and you say, but wait a second, it's in the elbows, knees, and major folds. Indeed, if you do a 4X and go into the groin or under the breast, you'll say, I've seen changes just like that in patients with TEN, and you would be correct. But the minute you go back to a 4X examination and you say to yourself, this distribution is odd and this lack of paintbrush erythema of the entire trunk is just not there. So what does this patient have? Well, this patient has toxic erythema of chemotherapy. And you will notice that in the um, descriptions of these newer monoclonal antibodies attached to say MMAE, and they uh, disrupt microtubules or they can bind, some of these uh, addicts will bind to DNA. Similar to chemotherapeutic agents, they're telling everybody they have TEN of the axilla and groin. No, they have tech, okay? Now, why do you wanna make the diagnosis of tech? We'll get to it in a minute. And the reason is, is because it doesn't have the same morbidity and mortality as TEN. In addition, you can dose reduce as a toxic uh, reaction, whereas nobody wants to re-challenge somebody with TEN. But there is a classic distribution pattern. It loves the axilla groin and under the panis as well. If you have a male patient, burning of the scrotum, early sign of the disease. If you look at the knees, that is not TEN. It is a central bulla, sterile, and then it will have buckshot around it, okay? And sometimes the buckshot, as you can see in the patient down here, has become purpuric. Why? Because the patient has low platelets. But nonetheless, this is not leukocytoclastic vasculitis. You have the confluent mothership, and then you have the little buckshot around it. And that is very, very classic. And you can see here in this younger patient, same thing, buckshot around it. Again, in that panis groove, you can see it that it's symmetric on the groove. It's symmetric on the inguinal crease, meaning if you draw a line down the inguinal crease, upper look, looks like lower, just the way sometimes you think of sebocerisis or seborrheic dermatitis. But you have, in this case, you have all that buckshot around it. On the hand, you can see why people think it's erythema multiforme. But if you look closely, oftentimes there'll be an accentuation in the creases, sort of the way you look for extra scale in tinea mana. But if you think about it, those creases on the hand are really intertriginous zones. So if you look, remember nothing of this lecture, try to remember this guy and how he looks so that you can walk in the room and make the diagnosis. But you will not be told that it's TEN just because it shows epidermal necrosis. The biopsies of these lesions show epidermal necrosis and slight vacuolar degeneration. So don't be told by the pathologist it has to be TEN, okay? Because again, remembering they're putting you on the highway, but you're picking the lane. And like a, like a, this is uh, truly is a shotgun wound, but it shows you what I mean by buckshot. So what are the drugs? Well, you're gonna see it a fair amount with acute leukemics because they're getting an anthracycline and ARC. You're gonna see it in people being prepped. Over 50% of the people being prepped with busulfan for say an autologous stem cell transplant will have tech. So it's out there um, and you just have to be able to recognize it. It gets better on its own. So you can trick yourself into thinking that you did something special by having the patient get better when in reality they got better on their own, sort of like what you think that you stabilized segmental vitiligo after a year, a year and a half of it being there. No, that's natural history. Okay. The one thing that screws people up is the fact that it can get worse one, even one month out from the chemotherapy. And so everybody may have had neutropenia, gotten four or five antibiotics, and what do people think uh, who don't know about tech? They'll walk in the room and say, oh, this must be cutaneous candidiasis because we've changed the microflora because we've given so many antibiotics. But the truth is 
these patients are off on, on triple therapy prophylactically. They're on an antiviral, an antifungal, often either voriconazole or posiconazole, as well as a, a quinolone or similar drug. So no, this is not Canada um, because one, they're already on posiconazole. It's their first time to see the voriconazole or posiconazole. So they haven't had time to have resistance. And the problem is if you had seen them on day one of the uh, appearance of erythema and burning, and perhaps it was most accentuated on the hands and feet, and so you said hand foot syndrome. Then you come back two or three days later, and now you have the axilla and groin are completely denuded. Now you're going to have to try to say that it's hand foot syndrome of the axilla and groin. Well, that doesn't go over too well. And then you go on to cutaneous candidiasis, but yet they're on an oral antifungal, and now you're stuck. So had you said that the patient from day one had tech, you could explain to them that just like poison ivy or other plant contact dermatitides, that certain areas of the body will react first and then it can move to other areas <clears throat> later on. It doesn't mean it's spread. It just means that different areas react differently on different days. And so that's why use of the term tech is a, um, is a good one. It allows you to not get stuck in the mud. Reminding you um, that sometimes it's difficult to see erythema of the scrotum, but you ask about burning. Number two, it can be difficult in darker skin phototypes to see the erythema. We all know that about erythroderma. But when you see that desquamation, be it dry on hands and feet or moist in major body folds, then you say to yourself, you had before that erythema, and now you're having the desquamation, in this case, moist, of tech. An interesting case. I always love case reports that I find really odd. And that is this person had had an axillary lymph node dissection as well as RT and got tech, but it was only on the side that still had the eccrine glands. So the thought is, of course, that the metabolites of the chemotherapy or the chemotherapy itself is being excreted in sweat. And so sometimes people will have the patients rinse in the shower several times a day, thinking that it might improve it. Whether that really works or not, I can't say. Other people will use high-dose vitamin D if it develops, but I'm talking about trying to prevent it from coming. And so... I don't know, you'd have to hold on to your uh, horses, but maybe botulinum toxin. The problem is I don't think too many people want it injected into their groin. The axilla, okay, but groin might be off base. So as I alluded to before, why do we want to distinguish between tech and TEN is because if you do dose reduction, you can reduce the chance of getting tech. And when I was in training, um, our differential diagnosis of TN was staph skull to skin syndrome, even if we weren't a baby and somebody with renal uh, disease, and we would call in the pathology resident and make them do a frozen section. I think there was this sense that if we're suffering at night, they have to suffer at night. We already went over SJS, but as times have become more complex, so has the differential diagnosis of TN. I already went over the generalized Bolsvix drug eruption. Uh, the TEN-like presentation of SLE is real. It can occur with immunosuppression being decreased, or it can also occur whenever uh, a de novo. And what is and another thought is that you have a patient in the hospital. They have TEN. You thought they were getting a bit better. You done the better, worse, same. They're getting a bit better, but then they seem to have get worse again. Remember that if a person has even a slight fever, has loss of skin integrity, the ICU team is gonna start vancomycin reflexively. And so always in the back of your mind, you have to remember that vancomycin can bring out an LABD that can look like TEN. So you need your DIF and that will help you because sometimes when you've made the diagnosis of TEN and you're trying to help people with the drug culprit was. Maybe you only had one moderate problem drug 
and two or three or five low prob. And so somewhere in your gut, you've, you have some sense that maybe I got it wrong. Okay. And so it's eaten away at you a little bit. Now they get worse. So you're even feeling worse about yourself. Always think of this vancomycin induced LABD. Now the three ones in green have very specific clinical scenarios. And so you're usually going to have a big clue, be it the chemotherapy, the person that somebody got an aloe, uh, stem cell transplant, and remember, if you're in an institution where a lot of people are getting grade four uh, acute GVHD from the stem cell transplants, you need to think twice about maybe using another hospital. And then congenital or that burned, scalded look that you can see in preemies. Every once in a while, and I've only seen this a couple of times, the number of pustules in somebody with HF became so many and so confluent that an entire area of skin the size of basketball just fell off. Um, but that's very unusual. And then every once in a while, there's an autoimmune uh, bolus disease. So here, whether you want to call it Rao syndrome or not, remember Rao really described what's in this picture, and that is atypical EM-like lesions in, in uh, people with systemic lupus. And remember, they have systemic lupus. So it's not like us when we have cutaneous lupus, and could it be a benign lymphocytic infiltrate because it's not quite characteristic yet? Is it like in planus? No, 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 no. You don't have that same DDX because these people have systemic lupus. So you will find evidence of systemic lupus, which will allow you to bolster your diagnosis. And it, as I said before, can occur with a decrease in immunosuppression or de novo. Now here we have six people and you might say, oh, all of them have TEN. I think the easiest one's in the middle, which is a patient with DIC. But because of the ischemia from the thrombosis, you can actually see ep loss of epidermis. And you can see that with that wrinkling of the skin uh, right here that will remind you if you were to only look close up and say, oh, this patient maybe has a bleeding diathesis and they really have TEN. This has been asked of me before. Uh, they really have TEN because of this loss of epidermis. No, step back, see the retiform purpura, look at the blood. Uh, parameters. And this patient simply has DIC with ischemia leading to loss of epidermis. But nonetheless, none of the other people have TEN. So let's take a look at what they really do have. And this is Bowles pemphigoid, that congenital candidiasis I talked about in preemies and uh, vancomycin LEVD, and then grade four uh, acute GVHD. And occasionally a person with tech will start off with the classic distribution, but have gotten so much drug and sometimes in the setting of renal disease that wasn't really appreciated, sort of as we as all as all dermatologists know about methotrexate in an elderly patient on an NSAID and a diuretic who has borderline kidney function can get into a lot of trouble. So with tech and it can become whole body. So I hope you've enjoyed my thesis that sometimes stepping back is better than a closer look. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that talk, Dr. Bologna. That was excellent. Um, I think we all learned a lot from that. I definitely did. Um, and I think we do have a few questions in the chat okay. that I believe Dr. Karen will read out to you now. Oh, okay, good. Because I don't really see it. The okay, chat. So okay. So the first question is from Sharma, who asks, um, do bullous drug eruptions start with small macules or larger patches that are widely spaced out? They start off this size. They don't expand. I don't know how many uh, patients you've seen with what are called EB nevi, epidermal lysis bullosis, bullosa nevi, but they look like melanoma. I mean, they are ugly and they're dark and they're big. But the key question is always, did the lesion start off this big or did it start off small and grow? And EB nevi start off big. And the same with the generalized bulls fixed drug eruptions. Those, re those lesions are that size from the get-go, okay? Okay, 
So our next question is from Memory who asks, um, do a short recap on SJS, TEN and fixed drug eruption lesions. What are the differences? In what, in, what was the beginning of the question a little bit? Steven, Steven Johnson syndrome and TEN versus what? fixed drug SJS. Clinically, histologically, which one? Um, I think both, because she doesn't specify. But the lesions, like I think, a, so clinically. Clinically. I think clinically. Clinically, well, you have large skip areas. The individual lesions can have the same duskiness, the same detachment, but you have to step back and see those large areas of uninvolved skin. In a classic FDE, there's usually, what, five maybe two, five lesions. So 95 plus percent of the body surface area is uninvolved. So nobody really has a problem with that. But once you start getting to about 15% body surface area, 20% body surface area, people start wondering whether or not it's uh, TEN, okay? Um, yeah, right. the rest are saying you had a great presentation. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, praise in the chat, but no other questions. So okay. I, think, I think that would be it for now. So I just wanted to thank everyone for attending. And I want to thank you, Dr. Bologna and Professor Griffith, so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody learned a great deal today. Um, we're very grateful for your time. Have a Bye. good week, everybody. See you. Bye. Thank you for the invitation. Bye. Bye.